Good morning and welcome to this week's online service. Uh, it's great that you've been able to tune in. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, if you haven't seen the video I made earlier in the week talking about our plans about how, how and when we're reopening our building and what for, um, then uh, please do take a moment to watch that video um, after this. Uh, I'll link it in the description below and uh, there'll be a link to it hopefully at the end of this video uh, as well. But uh, that's all talking about um, what's happening this evening and in future weeks. Um, what are we thinking about now? Well, last week, if you were here, Debs so helpfully reminded us uh, from James about how we are not in control of the future. We don't know what's going to come. We can't control what's going to come. But we don't need to panic. We don't need to worry because God is in control. Uh, God holds all things perfectly in his hands. In a moment, we're going to sing our opening hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. It's a hymn that uh, praises God for the fact that no matter what may happen, whether good or bad, whether we go through great times or rubbish times, because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross and because of the way in which he has 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 paid for our forgiveness and brought us into a right relationship with the Father. Because of all of that, we can sing, it is well. We can praise God, knowing that everything is okay, no matter what may go on. We're going to sing that in a moment. But before we do, uh, can I ask you to just take a moment to think for yourself about what you're worried about in your future? Are there things that you're worried will happen? Are there things that you're worried won't happen? Well, whatever it is, let's just take a moment now by ourselves quietly to, to kind of acknowledge that, to recognise that and to commit it to God in prayer. And then I will lead us in prayer. Our Father, we gather this morning as different people with different hopes and fears. But we thank you so much that the future is not in our hands, but is in yours. And we pray that whatever the things might be that we're worried about, things that we're worried might happen or things that we're worried might not happen. Lord, would you help us to trust you for the future? Would you help us to so delight in what Jesus has already done for us, that we may know whatever happens, it is well with my soul. Lord, we pray that today you will encourage us from your word. You will help us to trust you more and you would help us to find where true and lasting eternal joy is found. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing now, and then after that, Jasmine will read our Bible reading.
and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the labours who, who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud are crying out against you and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your heart in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Jasmine, thanks very much for reading. Uh, let's pray. Father, we ask that as we spend uh, these next 20 minutes or so uh, thinking about the passage that Jasmine has just read, uh, would you please help us to understand it? Would you help us to hear what you are saying to us now? Would you help us to apply it to our lives? And above all, Lord, would you help us to see where true and eternal treasure is really found? We pray, Lord, that the fruit of this time, looking at your word together, would be lasting joy that is found in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. James says some very strange things, doesn't he? Uh, if you can think back to the start of this series when we looked at chapter one, uh, you might remember James saying, uh, what did he say? Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. When things are really difficult for you, said James, count it joy, be happy. It's an odd thing to say. And he says something uh, similarly odd today. Uh, he, he's speaking to, to people with great riches. Uh, he says, if you're wealthy, if you've got plenty of money, then weep and howl. Weep and howl. 
That's not the normal reaction, is it, to having plenty of money? Having money is generally considered a good thing, uh, not a negative thing. Um, people celebrate rather than moan about pay rises or unexpected gifts or winning the lottery or, or something like that. Uh, we normally think that, that riches are a reason to celebrate, but James says, weep and howl. Why does James see riches as something that we should weep and howl about? Well, we're going to look at that uh, in God's Word now, and we're going to see three reasons that James has for seeing riches as something that should make us weep and howl. But, although we're going to spend quite a long time talking about weeping and howling, which might not be what you think you really want to think about on a Sunday morning, um, you would rather something more joyful, don't worry, this passage overall is very joyful. Because when we've seen those three reasons why riches might cause us to weep and howl, we are also going to see how James points us to where true and eternal and the most perfect treasure is really found. So even if we spend plenty of time thinking about weeping and howling, we certainly will end on why we should rejoice. Well, let's have a look. There are three reasons that James gives as to why riches could cause us, should cause us, to weep and howl. The first is that riches perish. Now, at the start of lockdown, uh, we didn't do very well in the vicarage at managing our fruit supplies. Uh, now, you might think that's not a big deal. Uh, what am I talking about? Well, we, we have, um, really wonderfully actually, a, a weekly vegetable box that's delivered. It just miraculously appears outside our door uh, once a week. And in it, there's always some lovely fruit. And um, we normally get through the fruit pretty quickly. It's, you know, it's nice, it's sweet, it's juicy. You see, it's, it's not something that kind of hangs around. Um, but at the start of lockdown, we, were, we realised we needed to try not to go to the supermarket uh, unless we absolutely had to. And so we tried to kind of eke out our fruit um, until the next delivery. We, we tried not to eat it in one go, but to save some of it up. And uh, you might think that's great in principle, but uh, if you remember, at the start of lockdown, the weather was lovely. Uh, everything was pretty warm. And what we found was that actually, as we approached the end of the week, yes, we still had fruit in our fruit bowl, but it had started to ferment and was not really worth eating. We tried to hold on to it, but it rotted. And James is saying that actually something similar to, uh, to that happens with riches. Have a look at verse, uh, verse, well, verse 1 and 2. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, uh, he says. In the Hebrew language, there is a thing called the prophetic perfect. It's a tense. And it's a way uh, in which you can speak about something that's not yet happened, something in the future. You can speak about it in the past tense as a way of indicating you are so certain that it will have happened. Uh, we do that in English when we say, you know, it's in the bag or something like that. Of course, it's not yet in the bag, but we're so sure it will be that we can talk about it as though it's already happened. Now, uh, James wasn't writing in Hebrew, he's writing in Greek, but he, he does kind of the same thing when he says, your riches have rotted. Uh, actually, they hadn't rotted yet. That's the whole point, isn't it? These wealthy people were enjoying their riches. But James is saying it is so certain that they will rot. It is so certain that they will come to an end that he can talk about it as though it has already happened. We're used, aren't we, to things wearing out in life. Um, some of you may uh, recognise when I talk about what used to be my favourite shirt. Uh, it was a very lovely colour of pink and it had a lovely herringbone pattern on it, uh, if you um, looked at it closely. Uh, it was so soft and comfortable. I, I absolutely loved it. But of course, because I loved it, I wore it a lot and it started to wear out. And of course, for a while, I tried to ignore that and uh, you know pretend it was still fine uh, but Kate started to say have you seen how 
how frayed it is around the collar. Have you seen the marks that are appearing on it? Henry, you really can't wear that shirt. And, um, well, I won't give you the, the details of the discussion that, that went on, but uh, this is where it ended up. Uh, this shirt is now rags. It is used for cleaning oil in the garage rather than uh, something that I wear. We will all have uh, experiences of other things like that, things that we loved but are no more. James is saying, actually, that will happen to riches. There are things that we tend to assume won't wear out. We might expect our, our shirts to wear out, but we, we don't expect to have to replace our home every few years. And if we move house, it's normally not because our home's fallen down and we need a new one, it, it's because we, we want to move. And we hope that our home will have held its value when we, when we come to sell it. So we expect our homes not to, to wear out and gold and silver in particular are things that we don't think of as wearing out. Um, gold is considered a very safe investment uh, when stock markets are in turmoil. But even if you don't think about investments, uh, the thing about gold is that it doesn't corrode. Um, archaeologists can dig up golden artifacts from thousands of years ago and they're still intact, they're still in good nick and, and you give them a bit of a polish and they, they still look really good. Gold doesn't corrode. But do you see what James says here? Your silver and your gold and silver, verse 3, have corroded. He's saying even the things that we consider to be the most certain and the most permanent, they will eventually wear out and fade. So here is James's first reason why the rich should weep and howl. Uh, you've built up this supply, he says, but actually you've not checked the best before date on it. James is so certain that a rich person's wealth will rot, will be eaten by moths, will corrode. Uh, he's so certain that that will happen that he can speak of it as though it has already happened. Now let me just give you something to, to consider here, something to think about. If you knew that your bank account would one day suddenly empty, all the money in it would just disappear. Or if you knew that the, the value of your investments would suddenly plummet and become nothing. Or if you knew that your pension fund would suddenly empty itself spontaneously. If you knew that, if, if you knew those things were going to happen, what difference would it make to you now? Well, you wouldn't invest in those things, would you? If you knew that those things were going to disappear, you wouldn't keep pouring money into them. But here we have the word of God saying, actually, that will happen. That is certainly what's going to happen. Gold and silver will corrode. Our wealth, our riches will rot away and disappear. and uh, It will become worthless. The things that we value so much and the things we're so confident about, James is saying, will one day come to nothing. So here is the first reason James gives for that the rich should weep and howl. You've spent your life building up your wealth and it is all going to be taken away. If your life's work has been about amassing wealth, then weep and howl, says James, because your life's work has been pointless. It's a waste of time. You've been barking up the wrong tree for your whole career, says James. So that's the first, and actually we're going to see it's the smallest of the reasons why we should weep and howl over riches. The second reason we should weep and howl over riches is that riches may be evidence that we don't really love God. They may be evidence that we don't really love God. Have a look at verse 3 again. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Now, how is the corrosion of someone's riches evidence against that person? How will it eat their flesh like fire? What, what does James mean here? Well, the language he's using, the language of rotting and, and being moth-eaten and corroding, that may well remind us of something that Jesus said. 
It's a very famous passage. It, it's read in the Book of Common Prayer communion service while the offering is being taken. And it's from Matthew chapter 6. And Jesus said this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now I think James is deliberately directing our thinking to those words of Jesus. And Jesus talks about two places where we can lay up treasure. We can lay up treasure on earth, he says, or we can lay up treasure in heaven. And he says, don't lay up treasure on earth because it gets stolen and it rusts. Lay up treasure in heaven because it will last forever. And I think that what James is getting at when he alludes to, to that language of Jesus is that if a person has a pile of rotten, moth-eaten, corroded riches, what that actually does is prove that the treasure that person stored up is treasure on earth, not treasure in heaven. Or as James puts it in verse 3, you have laid up treasure in the last days. What he means by that is you've chosen to lay up treasure in a world that's coming to an end. That's what the last days is about. It's looking forward to the day when Christ returns. You've chosen to lay up treasure in a world that's coming to an end instead of in heaven for all eternity. So the way in which riches are evidence against someone is that they show where that person chose to invest, on earth or in heaven, in a world that's coming to an end or in eternity. And remember what Jesus said? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if we've invested here on earth, that says our heart is here on earth. If we've invested in heaven, that says our heart is in heaven with God. Now look, we need to hear this rightly. I don't think James is saying that if you've got money, that automatically means that you don't love God. It's not saying if you've got riches, you definitely don't love God. But I think he is giving a challenge to each of us. And I think the challenge is, what does your bank statement say about where you're investing and where your heart is? If you were to look back, even just over the last week, or perhaps beyond that, over the, over the last month, and, and if you were to look at what you spent money on, where did your money go in that time? What does it show is important? Does it show that it's our comfort? Or does it show that it's the gospel that really matters to us? You see, where we spend our money is a brilliant diagnostic test of what really matters to us. Do we really love God or not? That's the second reason James gives us to weep and howl. Riches may well be evidence that we don't have treasure in heaven, that we don't love God and therefore that we don't have a place in eternity. That's how riches corroding will eat your flesh like fire, in James's language. Riches can be evidence that brings us under the just judgment of God, for reasons that we'll see in a moment. So the first reason to weep and howl over riches is that they perish, they rot, they, they disappear. Uh, the second is they may well be evidence that we don't really love God. The third reason that James gives why riches should lead us to weep and howl is they may well be evidence that we don't really love people. A few years ago, some of our neighbours across the road were burgled. And actually, at first, it wasn't them that discovered they had been burgled. They were, I think, away on holiday in the Lake District at the time. But what happened was that the police just happened to notice a young man carrying a very large television in the middle of the night. They thought that was slightly odd behaviour, and so they stopped him. And when 
Slightly later on, the broken door at the back of uh, their, our neighbour's house was discovered and the mess in their sitting room. Uh, when it was discovered that they had been burgled, uh, there wasn't much doubt about who had done it. Their television was missing. The police had found this man strangely carrying a television in the middle of the night. It was fairly incriminating evidence against him, wasn't it? And, and James was saying to the riches, to the rich people of 2,000 years ago, that actually their riches were, ev were incriminating evidence in the same way. The fact that they were found with great wealth was evidence that they had stolen from people. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, have a look at verse 4. Behold, the wages of the labourers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. James was speaking about people who had got wealthy by withholding money that was due to people who had worked for them. Their wealth proved their fraud. It proved their injustice. Just as this man holding the television proved that he had stolen from our neighbours, so these rich people of James's day, their wealth proves that they had mistreated those who worked for them. Now this is very topical, isn't it? Um, ever since the kind of removal of statues and everything surrounding Edward Colston in Bristol uh, has come to light and, and been in the media recently, I, I'm not going to talk about the rights and wrongs of what we should do with statues and, and so on, but, but isn't it interesting how it has highlighted the way in which people are, are rightly angered when people's wealth has come about through the exploitation of others? When people are wealthy because of how they've treated others, it rightly angers us. And that's exactly what James is talking about. James says that the money sitting, uh, <clears throat> sorry, that the money you're sitting on joins with the cries of the people who have been exploited in calling out to God for justice. Your money is crying out against you. And those cries have reached the ears of the Lord, says James. You're not going to get away with exploiting people like that, says James. And it may seem that people have taken their complaint to the grave. These people who have been so horribly mistreated, they're all dead now. Surely their voice is silent. But James says, no, your wealth will continue to accuse you. Have a look at verse 5. You've lived on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. This is James saying, you've watched your investment pot grow. You've fattened up your nest egg nicely. But actually, what you've really done is fatten up your heart like cattle being prepared for slaughter. This is brutal stuff, isn't it? So what we've seen is that riches can be evidence that someone doesn't really love God. And here we see that riches can similarly be evidence that someone doesn't really care about our fellow human being. Verse 6, you've condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now once again, let me say that riches don't inevitably mean you don't care about people. There are people, it's possible to be a person who is wealthy and who cares deeply about people. But again, here is the challenge to us. How sure are you that the things you own, the clothes you wear, perhaps the food you eat, how sure are you that, they, that the people who produced those have not been exploited? How sure are you that the things you have uh, have not involved the suffering of people perhaps in the developing world. You see, just as the way in which we spend our money can be a great diagnostic test as to whether or not we love God, so the way in which we spend our money can be a great diagnostic test of whether or not we love our neighbour or just ourselves. So here's the third reason why riches might make us weep and howl. They're evidence not only that we might not love God, but also 
evidence that we might not love God's people. And do you remember what Jesus said when he was asked what is the greatest commandment? He said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So that Jesus said the greatest thing that every human being is called to is firstly to love God and secondly to love people. And if we've seen that riches can be evidence that we don't love God and that we don't love people, well then we need to realise this is a really big deal. It may be evidence that we have completely failed at the very thing Jesus said was most important. Riches therefore can be the evidence that condemns us before God's judgment. So, what should we do? In the light of all of this, what should we do about our money? What should we do with our money? And importantly, where can we find the opposite of weeping and howling? Well, if we recap what we've seen, I think it will help us to see what to do. Uh, the first thing we've seen is that riches will perish. So what should we do? Well, doesn't that mean there is no point in trying to hold on to riches? Uh, there's no point in trying to gather them up if we know that they will perish. I think James wants to see that the safest thing we can do with our wealth is give it away. The safest thing we can do with our wealth is give it away. Secondly, we've seen that riches may be evidence that we invest in earth rather than in heaven. So what should we do? Well, use our money to invest in heaven. Isn't that the obvious kind of consequence of this? We need to use our money in a way that shows that what we love most or who we love most is God. What we value most is our treasure in heaven, not our treasure on earth. Jesus, those words of Jesus again from Matthew 6, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is saying here that there is a treasure that will never fade. A treasure that will never spoil. Uh, uh, there is an investment whose value will never go down. It will only ever go up. And it will last for all eternity. I mean, think about this. It, no matter how, how great your investments are, no matter how big your savings are, no matter how healthy your pension pot is, how long are you going to be enjoying it for? Will you be enjoying it in 20 years? 50 years? 100 years? 200 years? Well, Jesus wants us to see there is treasure that lasts all eternity. And that treasure is him. He is the one who uniquely satisfies the longing of every human heart. He is the bread that he gives to us that means we will never go hungry. He is the water that means we will never go thirsty. He is the love that means we will never know loneliness. We will never know lack or longing for all eternity. What what James and Jesus want us to see is that there is a true treasure that we can invest in and that will not cause us to weep and howl. Investing in heaven uh, really is about using our money in ways that further the gospel and glorify God. Last week in, in this online service we heard from Sean, uh, someone who's about to graduate as a student and is going to be spending a year uh, working with the Christian unions in Nottingham, uh, supporting them in their work, trying to help them and trying to, trying to bring people to know Jesus. And Sean told us about how he needs to raise both prayer support and financial support for that to be possible. Perhaps in the light of this sermon you, you need to think about uh, whether, he, whether giving to him might be a good way of investing in heaven. And there'll be a link in the description below about how you can give to him. But it's not only, it's not only him. We, we have a number of mission partners that we support as a church. Um, Cross Teach 
who we're going to hear from later in the prayers. Uh, Tony and Kath Swanson with Africa Inland Mission in Tanzania. Uh, or, or, or also simply it could be about giving to your church. We at St Mary's have been hit hard by coronavirus. Um, a good chunk of the church hall's income, that, uh, of the church's income that, that kind of covers some of our running costs, has always been lettings of our church hall. The church hall has been closed for several months. That means we are running at a very significant deficit in our budget. Um, it's not yet cause for great concern, but it certainly is cause for prayer. And it certainly is a reason why giving to your local church may well be a valuable way in which you can invest in heaven. Again, there'll be details uh, in the description below um, about how you can do that. So look, um, if what we've seen from James is that riches can be evidence that we invest in earth rather than heaven, the challenge to us is to deliberately be using our money to invest in heaven, to lay up treasures in heaven. But then the third thing we saw as we went through is that evidence, uh, riches can be evidence not only that we don't care about God, but also that we don't care about people. So here again is the, is the final challenge, to use our money in a way that shows we do care about people. To use our money in a way that might ease poverty and support those in need. And actually, what I was just saying about investing in heaven, investing in uh, the people or the organisations that can make the good news of Jesus known, that is a great way of showing that we care deeply about people. Because the greatest thing that we can ever do for someone is point them to where eternal and unfading joy can be found. Let's pray. Father, we've seen James say that riches, whilst they might appear to be such good news, may actually not be good news at all, may be reasons to weep and howl. Lord, we want to thank you for the wealth you have given us, and we pray that you would help us to treat it rightly and to use it wisely. We pray, Lord, that we would be in the business of laying up treasure in heaven, not on earth. We would be looking for the riches that will never fade, will never spoil, but will always be there. Lord, I pray that you would give us all wisdom as we think about our finances. And would you challenge us by your Spirit where we need to use them differently. We pray, Lord, that we would use our money in such a way as honours you, furthers your kingdom, and shows that we, sh that we love you and we love your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing now. And this next song is a song that celebrates the great riches we have in heaven, the great treasure that is Jesus. Let's sing together.
Debs and Luke, it is really good to see you both. Thank you for spending a bit of time kind of updating me, updating us on what's going on with Cross Teach uh, and so on. Um, we've been praying for you and we will continue to, to pray for you. Um, a month or so ago, we spoke to Wayne and we heard from him. Uh, you were both on furlough then. Um, could you tell us a bit about what you got up to while you were on furlough. Debs, I can see that you were mainly concentrating on growing your hair, um, but um, what, what, what else were you doing whilst on furlough? What was it like for you? My hair is so sad. Um, so uh, at the beginning of furlough, I personally found it quite hard because um, to all of a sudden stop work when there's work to be done and when there were things that I wanted to do for cross teach and and when you've been working that long to just stop for that long is is I found it really hard to get my head around but actually it was a really good time of rest um I, I started doing more exercise and, and and got the bike out and started cycling um I was able to do a bit more by the way of supporting church and um I, I did some online children's workshops with another Christian charity um i was able to spend a bit of time helping with my local community and doing shopping for some older people and, and just resting and actually i'm really praising god for that time because even though i didn't want it i feel like it was a really positive time once i allowed it to be um for me i think uh yeah similar to devs um in that yeah like with a lot of people it, it was it, it was a mental strain uh for, for quite a while um uh not having that routine sort of not knowing what the future of cross teach was going to be um that that was hard um but uh yeah there were a lot of positives um yeah my son jesse was six months old when lockdown began and you know it really was uh, a joy to be able to spend so much time with him that i wouldn't have been able to spend uh before um and to kind of uh i guess yeah even to the extent of learning how to kind of be a, a full-time dad really um and yeah like dad had been able to get much more involved in church than i uh, had had done for a while uh that was really positive and um i think just learning to rely on god more as well um I, i'm sure a lot of people have felt the same but in a time where uh, there aren't obvious answers as to what life is going to be like and what's going to happen next. Just to kind of strip everything back and just completely uh, rely on God um, and and learn to trust Him more has just been really, really valuable for me as well. So you've now been back at work for three weeks. Four yeah, weeks? Three, weeks. three weeks. Almost. Yeah. Um, you tell us a bit about what you've been doing in that time and actually what it's felt like to come back to work. For me, it's been really nice. Uh, it's been nice to be back in touch with schools and supporters and churches again. Um, I really, really enjoyed that um, when you've had sort of three months of feeling really isolated. Uh, a couple of things we've been doing um we we've been in touch with all all those people that i've mentioned or trying to be in touch and had some really encouraging conversations uh about uh september and the autumn term and what we could provide and we've had some really really encouraging feedback from schools which has uh just been a real a real joy uh a real encouragement so that's been great so we spent a lot of time making resources for schools so even though we're not physically in person in school we are still able to teach about the christian faith um and we've been doing a series of video assemblies where luke and i have been prancing around his garden like fools um and recording each other and editing them to help young people um find out more about what it means to be a christian and what christians believe um and we're trying to make those available to schools and churches and parents so um if you're interested let us know and we'll, we'll send you a, a copy and hopefully we'll carry on doing that 
um, for the foreseeable future really. Um, next Friday, so we've got one week left at work and then we're back on furlough, but we're hoping to come back in September and hoping to do some of the same things then. So you've just mentioned uh, Friday going back on furlough. Um, what, what does, as far as you can guess, what does the future hold for you both? So in the immediate future, we will be back on furlough. Um, we're not sure when we will come back off furlough, but we hope it will be sometime in September. Um, our communications with schools have led us to believe that most schools will be thinking about bringing external visitors back in around October half term, um, unless things change. But some schools have actually asked us to come in and teach from September with sort of adapted regulations. So we're hoping that We'll have a few weeks on furlough and then we'll come back off furlough and we'll be able to get straight back into some schools teaching lessons um, about Christianity whilst doing online resources until we're able to get back in all schools. Um, but we've had um, inundated requests for Christmas experience. So it looks like Christmas experience will be going ahead this year, God willing, um, in school um, if the bookings are anything to go by. Um, and schools seem really keen for us to come back in. So we're really hoping that we'll be able to be back in um, as soon as we can. Yeah, I guess I'm hoping that uh, having done this period of work and um, having hopefully uh, set up quite a lot of things for the autumn term, hoping that it will make me us feel a lot better about uh, being off um, for the sort of six weeks um, of summer. Um, and I guess we'll just be really hoping and praying that we will be back in September, as, as Deb said. I think the last thing I would ask you both uh, is simply how we can pray for you. I think um, a few things, really. I think we'd love prayer for Luke and myself as we go back on furlough that, yeah, that we would have a good few weeks on furlough and, and come back uh, in September rested and um, ready to, to get stuck back in. Um, and just pray for us as there's still quite a lot of uncertainty around when we'll come back and which schools will be working and how we'll be working. So we'd appreciate prayer that we manage that well and that God continues to open doors in schools um, and gives us and Wayne and the trustees real wisdom to know when's the right time to go back in and, and how we can do that safely. I think as well as being a charity, we always have financial needs um, and it, it was amazing to see uh, how God met those needs um, in in the spring and summer term and provided what we needed with all our online campaigns uh, and that's such a blessing and we're so so thankful for that. Uh, of course we're now already um, appealing for, uh, for funding for uh, the next academic year. Um, we have new targets. Um, I think it's a hundred thousand pounds for the National Cross Teach Debs, is that right? I think it's something like that. We haven't got the finalised budget yet. Right, um, and uh, so um, we really appreciate prayer for that. Helena's will be returning to work from maternity leave at the end of September, so I'd appreciate prayer for her. And um, yeah, we've, uh, we've had to set up uh, um, our childminder for September without really having properly met her or been to uh, to the place where he'll be because we weren't able to do so. So I appreciate prayer for that. And for Jesse, I suppose it'd be the same with uh, with babies, or with children, with a lot of people of a lot of ages that actually uh, there's always the concern that, okay, they've not been really used to seeing other people for three or four months. And for Jesse, he's not been held by anyone other than me and uh and helena for uh four months now and so you know we just kind of hope that it, that transition will 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 be okay um and that he'll get used to it quickly um so yeah appreciate prayer for that we will be praying for you both now in the service um but it won't only be in the service we do often pray for you guys and your work and that will continue. Thank you so much for being so good at being in touch and uh, yeah, do keep in touch. Well, let's pray for them uh, in the way that they asked, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for Debs and Luke and for the work they do. 
and we pray for them and for their work. Lord, we pray that when they go back on furlough, um, it would be a really good few weeks of rest for them. We pray that when they restart, whenever that will be, they would do so refreshed and ready and uh, full of energy and vision uh, for the work. Lord, we do commit to you that whole uncertainty about when and where and how they'll be restarting. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would help them to trust you and we pray that you would give great wisdom to uh, the trustees and to the leadership of Cross Stitch uh, as they kind of take that forward. And we do pray that they would keep finding open doors, they would keep finding uh, opportunities to go and do the work that you've given them to do. Lord, we commit to you the ongoing financial needs of Cross Teach. Thank you so much for how you have been so faithful in, in giving them the money they need thus far. Please, Lord, would, would that continue? And please, would, would their confidence for the future uh, come not from the money that they have in the bank or the money that is pledged, but their confidence that you are a great God who provides? Uh, Lord, we pray uh, for their wider, their wider lives as well. And particularly, we pray uh, for Luke's wife and son. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you bless Helena as she comes to go back to work in September. And we pray for Jesse, that you would help him to transition well uh, from, from only being held by his parents for several months uh, to being in the care of a childminder. Please. Bless them, Lord, and provide for them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And we continue to pray for our church and our parish and our world. Heavenly Father, we've already heard something of the financial challenges that we as a church are facing with the closure of our church hall. We do pray uh, that you would be providing for us uh, that uh, that that may not become a big distraction or, or ultimately a, a big problem for us continuing our ministry as we long to. Lord, we pray uh, that you would help us to continue to grow uh, closer to one another and to you. And we pray, Lord, that you'd give us wisdom about the whole process of uh, when we reopen and, and restart more normal services and so on. But in the meantime, while we're doing stuff online, please, would you continue to meet with us in your word? Would you lead us as we pray and as we sing? Uh, please, would you help us to be growing in you and to be honouring you? And Lord, we do pray for an end to coronavirus. We pray, Lord, for all the work that is being done uh, on working on a vaccine and treatments and so on. Uh, we pray that you would bless the scientists in their work. We pray that you would bless uh, our leaders in this country and, and global leaders and especially, Lord, we pray uh, for the leaders of America as their number of cases seems just to be skyrocketing. skyrocketing. Dear Lord, please uh, have mercy on that land and on your world. Please bring this virus to an end. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to pray the collect uh, for today. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer, which we offer for all your faithful people, that in our vocation and ministry we may serve you in holiness and truth to the glory of your name through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to go over to Kate and Ali now, and uh, they're going to help us think about treasure in heaven, and uh, you might find something slightly piratical about what they do. Good morning, children. Hi! 
We are playing pirates today in our pirate ship. Here's a joke for you. What is a pirate's favourite letter of the alphabet? C? It's C because pirates love the sea. Now we're being pirates today because pirates love treasure. And treasure is what we're talking about today. Pirates will do anything to get treasure. Pirates will even steal treasure from other people. <laughs> they love things that are precious and sparkly and shiny. Would you like to have a look inside our treasure chest and see our treasures? Arr, let's have a look at our treasures. We just dug this up. Oh, let's see what we've got here, Ali. Could you oh, explain it to us? On my old swimming trunks. They don't fit me anymore, sadly. Oh, they were really good when they fitted you. Yeah. At least we oh, still chocolate. have these chocolates. Open them oh, up. Gone. Oh, God, who ate them all? Oh, just wrappers. Hey, how about this? Your pirate pipe. You can play us a oh, tune. Oh, yeah. Shh. It's broken, isn't it? Now I can only do two notes. Oh, oh well. Oh, how about this? This is where you find the real treasure. The it's our jewels. bag of jewels. Open it up. Let's pour out the jewels. Well, there's nothing in there. Yeah. Where's it gone? All the jewels, they've been stolen. Ah! All our treasures hey, have gone. Stowaways. Oh, stowaways in our pirate ship. Who's this? Possum and Rhino. Why are you in our pirate ship? They say they want to talk to us about treasure. Oh, right, okay. Um. Hopefully they have some. Rhino says, why do we like our treasure so much when it doesn't last? Well, I wish we could have some that lasted forever. I wish we had treasure that lasted forever, Rhino, but it's just not like that. But Rhino says that in the Bible it talks about treasure that does last forever. But what? it's not something we can touch and hold like these treasures. Well, that makes no sense. It's Jesus. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Rhino says if we love Jesus the most, we are storing up treasure for ourselves in heaven. Oh. Rhino says if we read the Bible, we can find out more about what Jesus said. Yeah. Shall we do that? Right, yeah. tell you what, here's the Bible that Rhino brought with him. You put the treasure chest back. That's it, lovely. Would you, maybe you and Possum would like to read it, or I'll just hold Possum while you read the Bible. There's a note here. Oh, right, is that way, what would you like us to read? Matthew, chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Captain Ali, could you read those? Don't store treasures for yourselves here on earth, where moths and rust will destroy them, and thieves can break in and steal them. But store your treasures in heaven where they cannot be destroyed by moths or rust and where thieves cannot break and steal them. Your heart will be where your treasure is. Oh, that mm. sounds good, doesn't it? I want to have treasure in heaven, not these old treasures. But if we get rid of these treasures, then our box is empty and it looks like we've got no treasure. I can't see any treasure. Possum says, we can't see Jesus now because he is our treasure in heaven and we are here on earth. That's why we can't see him. Oh, but if we love Jesus the most, then one day we do get to see him and we'll get to go and live with him forever. Huh. Possum said, if we keep the Bible in our treasure chest, it would help us to remember Jesus. Hooray! Let's do that. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oops. Possum said, even while we're waiting to see Jesus, he can hear us and we can talk to him if we pray. Shall we have a go at that? Yeah. 
Great, okay, let's pray, animals. Children at home, are you ready to pray? Dear Jesus, I want you to be my treasure and the thing that I love most. If I love you the most and treasure you, I can come and see you in heaven one day and be with you forever and ever. Please help me to remember you while I'm waiting. Please help me not to love the things that I can see and touch because they will soon be gone. Help me to love you because you last forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, animals. Now, children, I've got an idea of something you could do at home. You could make a treasure chest like this. You need to find an old box and you need loads and loads of glue and some old wrapping paper. So I just covered the box and the paper in glue and I cut lots of different shapes and just stuck them all over each other. It took some time and it took a long time to dry, but in the end, you have a treasure chest like this. So if you'd like to see the instructions... I don't mind giving them in. Thanks. If you'd like to see the instructions, you can find them on our website at www.smwp.co.uk. Now, we're going to sing a song called Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. And it talks about how Jesus came down from heaven to rescue us and how he takes our sins away and how we can wait for him and be with him one day. And when we sing, Lord, we lift your name on high, it's like saying, Jesus, you are my treasure. So let's sing that to Jesus now. Thank you Kate and Ali and thank you Catherine and as always thank you Lawrence as well for uh, doing wonders on the organ behind the scenes. Well our time together is now uh, drawing to a close. Um, I'm going to pray a final prayer asking God's blessing on us and then we'll head over to Zoom to meet with others uh, from the church family. Do join us if you can. But for now uh, let's pray. Almighty God thank you so much that in Jesus there is eternal infinite treasure. We pray that we would live our lives fixed on him, not on the things of this world. And as we pray that as we go through the rest of our lives, we would know him to be our treasure. And we pray, Lord, that we would know your blessing, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, see you on Zoom. God bless.